This edition of Tech Talk is brought to you by Globalspeak.com, new media consultants, corporate video and audio communications, video and audio production and distribution, live and virtual event production. Tag TV and Tag Radio is a service of Globalspeak.com, creatively delivering powerful marketing, video, and audio solutions. Todd, welcome to Tech Talk. It is great to be here with you, Frank. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. I, I, I know that uh, one of the great things, you know, a lot of times we talk about where Georgia leads, and usually it's the obvious things that are like fintech or Internet security. Uh, I, I can't say for sure you can enlighten us and to our listeners about how good we're doing as far as gaming is concerned, but certainly high res as a company is really from a leadership, an early situation here in, in, in Alpharetta, here in Atlanta, and uh, is really uh, doing some global things and making a, a pretty strong impact on the marketplace. I know you might not say it, but I have to because the buzz is all over the place. But that said, let's talk a little bit about to the to w- w- most of us are are kind of um, uh, probably have a misunderstanding in terms of how it all works. But maybe give us a little insight on how do you make money doing what you're doing. I know, like for example, the, one of the successful games you literally have tens of millions, right, of players online across the globe is that from a download how do you make revenue doing that how, how what's that's the a, revenue modeling that is a great question so um first of all it is a it is a large industry just gaming in general globally it's uh it's a hundred billion dollar industry hardware and software so uh bigger than than box office receipts uh when you compare it to film wow. and um our business model is a bit unique in that it's a freemium model which is called free to play in the in the world of gaming and so the games that we make are all played online there's a a client program that you download to your windows pc or your macintosh or your xbox one or your playstation 4 we support all those platforms with our most popular game which is called smite and it is free for you to download that game so it spreads quite nicely through word of mouth Frank tells you, hey, this game is good. You should try it. How much does it cost? Oh, it's free. So you download the client for free, and most of the elements that actually affect the gameplay also do not cost you any money. You can earn them just by playing the game and, and basically cashing in your, your game time or experience points. Okay, what so really experience, drives experience points in this case would be the incentives as you progressively go through the challenge. Exactly, yeah. You're playing other people uh, with and against other people, so both cooperatively and competitively, almost like a virtual sport, which we can get to in a bit as far as the mechanics. But at the end of the day, the revenue comes because players get attached enough to the experience and to certain playable characters in the game that they want to customize that experience, mainly through cosmetic items. So Smite is themed around mythology. You might be playing the god Zeus, and I'm playing the goddess Athena. We have 80 characters from all over the world, uh, more than seven different families or pantheons of, of mythological creatures. But once you get attached to that Zeus, maybe you want to look a little bit different than all the rest of the Zeuses that are playing on the server. And basically, we sell you digital fashion items. So believe it or not, it is males... 18 to 35, playing <laughs> virtual dress-up online that really drives the revenue model for the company. Uh, it'll take me a second to catch my breath because being totally naive and, and not a gamer whatsoever, and I mean I'm, I, I get enough to probably be dangerous to just try to describe it, is that an unusual model or is that something that other – is that something you guys pioneered? I got, I'm, I'm fascinated by that because, in, in other words, you actually are investing in the production – and then taking the production and putting it out with a viral social type distribution into a, I'm assuming uh, you certainly know the environment and the market, so you know how to drop that particular touch point and get it started in terms of the grass fire in a social environment. But that said, um, here you've got, and, and am I right? Aren't, aren't them? What's the numbers on Smite? Isn't it uh, worldwide? Aren't you in the millions? We are. So in terms of registered players, so people who have downloaded and, and played uh, Smite, it's uh, well over 20 million at this point, and it, and it is global. A significant um, portion of our playing population is, is outside of North America, um, primarily Western Europe, but also we have players in China and, and 
Latin America, Brazil, crazy. That's crazy. Et That's crazy. I, I'm, I'm, I know you've lived it and developed it, so it's got to be something pretty natural to you. But to listen to it, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, will you eventually have a fashion market where designers will come online and put ideas up and sell them? I'm kidding, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking that you're actually, years ago, we used to talk about you're either an economy or an application. An application simply weren't going to exist longer than a year or two because they'd be absorbed by an economy. So actually, Smite, I mean, talk about the engagement and the relationship, the embracing, if you will. I mean, passion to the degree that they would actually extend real-world currency in order to buy virtual fashion. I mean, that's that's pretty in a, in a pretty intense relationship from a customer relationship would be concerned. It would seem to me that that $20 million represents some interesting possibilities for cross-merchandising of some kind beyond, you know, what boots Thor wears or something. You know? Yeah. You're exactly right, and for anyone in town that's been to uh, Dragon Con, for example, uh, you know which happens in, in September, and seen the, the amount of cosplay or costume play that goes on, they they get a feel for how this dress up extends even beyond the the virtual sure. world. So um, it, it definitely is uh, fandom and passion, as you say. So I mean, a couple things unique about the company. Um, one, which you alluded to, is we have a very community driven development process because because all of our games are not actually narratives. It's not that you play the game and you get to the end and you're done. Um, they're not even, in fact, very story-driven. It's really the players um, with, that assume these different characters that, that make the fun. You know, they, they make the stories. The stories are more similar to what you would experience in sports, um, whether playing sports or spectating them, where you're talking around uh, the water cooler around, you know, hey, in your game of basketball, you your team made this great play, and you thought you were going to lose, and then at the end you pulled it out. And all of our games have that same basic design where you're cooperating. Um, you're not basketball players. You're assuming the powers of literal gods, which is, which is a pretty cool experience, but you're playing – in a 40-minute match, and you're either winning or losing, accomplishing an objective within that match, and then you talk about it the next day, and, and maybe you need to try a different character or a different right. strategy. So there is this community um, aspect that is as important to the, uh, to the success of the game. And then, as you alluded to, a lot also comes from strong aesthetic design. So we don't have a lot of fashion designers, but we have many, many, I mean, uh, you know, in the, in the order of magnitude of 50 plus digital artists that focus on how they design compelling characters and compelling outfits for those characters so that our players do fall in love with the characters and, and, and really have that attachment. How long did it take Disney to start merchandising it at Walmart? Yeah, I'm, it sounds to me like I'm going to start seeing Smite costumes at next Halloween or at Christmas or something that I'll be able to physically buy at a store. I, I'm exaggerating to make a point because I, I can see the, we used to say long tail on something like this. I've got to ask you this, Todd. What in the world does a, a brainstorming session look at your place? I mean, you can, <laughs> get, give me the chicken and egg on where in the heck Smite came from because you're describing something that's pretty rich, and that's how it possibly ended up or maybe even self-corrected itself as you progressively launched it and dealt with the community, but that said, it's a, you guys sat around a table and said, let's do this, and this is what you came up with, or was it, a, 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 you know, what we say, accidental excellence? Yeah, a little of both, really. So we do, um, the game industry tends to be people that are subject matter experts, that honestly, the people here would be creating games whether they got paid or not. It's comparable to being in a band um, from that respect. So there's a lot of knowledge and passion around it and, and no lack of ideas. In the case of Smite, actually, it started out its life as being um, basically an extension to a previous game. So the very first game that we made when the company was started 11 years ago was a science fiction game called Global Agenda, and it had a lot of different game modes and experiences. And we were basically prototyping yet another a module for that game. And after we just started playtesting, which is a big part of our process, just test the idea early and, and see if it's fun or not, it was, it was fun and interesting enough that we internally thought, hey, this really deserves to be a whole new title, not just an extension to another game that, that actually wasn't performing all that well from a business standpoint. It was a great game, but it had a relatively small player base. And we said, hey, let's take this 
not just make it a game mode, let's launch it as a brand new title. That was decision one. And decision two was the theme. And we thought, rather than science fiction, um, actually, Erez, our CEO, had a, had a note in his notebook that was like, one day let's make a, a God versus God mythological game. And so we thought, hey, what if we applied that theme to this game? If we did that, it would mean two more years of developing the art assets versus launching in about three months with the art assets we had already built for the original game. So it was a doubling down as far as the investment, a bigger bet, but there was so much internal excitement across every function just when people heard the elevator pitch. Again, it's kind of like who wins between Batman and Superman. In this case, it's like who wins when Thor battles Zeus. Like That just got everyone's attention, and so we rallied around that, and that became Smite. Well, obviously, that kind of segues perfectly into eSports because I'm guessing that at some point um, there's so much passion and so much excitement centered around the competition that you can sell tickets to it. So, I mean, I, what, give us a little indication. Let's, let's migrate into next generation. I, I've got so many questions. We're going to have to do another interview another time because I'm thinking to myself, uh, that kind of mentality has got to get bored real quick in terms of how to develop the story through and through and through and through to such detail that it can constantly change from where it was to where it's going. And I would think that they'd kind of not necessarily abandon, but be looking for what's next rather than trying to figure out how to add another layer onto uh, the, the latest version. But that may be just from my per my standpoint as far as c being creative is concerned. Because, again, I'd love to delve. You know, w we've talked before, and you and I, and, uh, about even the future of gamification and, and how what you're doing plays so much into, you know, let's say fine fintech. And if it isn't a game already, it's going to be one pretty close to it in terms of incentives and various rewards and awards and recognition of one kind or another. Sadly, we don't have really enough time right now to go into that, but I'm going to hopefully ask you to come back again. We'll maybe delve into that a little deeper. But let's talk about uh, another growth area, and that's eSports. I mentioned about it. It's a uh, what is esports from your perspective, and what's what's it, its appeal? Yeah, so esports has um, really come into the mainstream over the last uh, two years, I would say, where you know there's headlines in, in mainstream publication, but it's actually been brewing and, and simmering um, for more than ten years, uh, starting actually in in uh, South Korea. Um, and basically, there's I guess two ways you can think of it. Um, from a gamer perspective, the the idea of esports is you have a competitive game that has a high enough skill ceiling, um, meaning it it actually uh, involves a lot of of talent and practice, and it's compelling enough that it becomes a spectator sport. So not only do people get really into it when they're competing, but it's interesting enough for other people to actually watch that activity, and that sounds a little crazy um, to people from the outside until you look at other comparable things like maybe NASCAR that involves a, a man and a machine cooperating together or, or a woman and a machine or something like poker where after online sure. poker became super popular and more people were exposed to poker, ESPN started showing poker tournaments and other people watched. How about or golf even TV? Sport. I remember the yeah, first time golf I saw TV. Guy, I thought, we're going to watch golf on television. <laughs> Who's going to sit there and watch golf on time? And, of course, you know, it, uh, the rest is history. So uh, I, clearly the model is there. Yep, exactly. So that's one way to look at it. Another way, you know, from the business and advertiser standpoint, the way they look at it is they say, number one, uh, there's all these millennial cord cutters out there. Number two, they see viewership of traditional sports on the decline, the NFL on all of the major networks uh, declined year over year um, last year as far as viewership. And so they're asking themselves, where are people going? And when they look at uh, where millennials, particularly males 18 to 35 with a decent amount of disposable income, are going, they're watching via the Internet other people play video games. So there's a site out there called Twitch TV and um, you go there through any browser or through your mobile phone, and you don't pay anything, and you can watch other people play video games. And believe it or not, their monthly audience is over 100 million active. <laughs> so if you aggregate that audience, it's equal to 
a CNN or an MTV, basically, you know, a cable size network audience. And these are raw live yeah. streams, or is there actually announcers? And I mean, the kind of thing you would see at, a, like I mentioned, golf or NASCAR or something, or do they? Because I would, I would see the entertainment aspect of watching something I was passionate about. I could also see technique, strategy. I'm sure there's a lot of depth in there other than just the uh, entertainment, for lack of a better description. Yeah, you're exactly right. And there's all types of content. There's everything well, from who knew? You know, just who did? a guy or girl in his basement with a webcam to very highly produced content. And, and we do both. So there will be people playing our game Smite literally, you know, from their basement or bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, they just happen to be very good or very entertainment or very entertaining to fully produced esports events that really look equivalent to watching ESPN or Turner, you know, and, and catching, uh, you know, a, a college basketball game where you have coat and tie announcers and commentators and statistics across the bottom and motion graphics and brackets and kids in uniform. So you have that entire extreme. And what makes it so appealing is – if you can again imagine if you're if you're a basketball fan and you had the opportunity to not only watch LeBron James uh in the championship game in a nicely produced event but also seeing him practice in his home gym and you actually had an interactive way to while you watched him type text chat questions and he might respond and call you out by name and you're also responding with the other viewers it's that combination of of interactivity with gaming which is by definition interactive that makes it a really uh, compelling experience for for people that are into these games and, and want to get better and uh, want to learn from the best or just be entertained well you know I, again coming at it as an amateur and a tourist uh, not even an amateur but more of a tourist looking into it the first thing I'm thinking about is these cruise ships that have got tens of thousands of people and climbing mountains and, and uh, surfing and and I think to myself, the last thing anybody's doing is going on a cruise. I mean, they're not going from my old, from the old world perspective. You went there with a chase lounge and a drink with a umbrella, and it relaxed. But here's a case where you've got to be engaged, and it's a, um, a sensory overload, I guess, for lack of a better description. It's a fascinating thing. I certainly know from the outside looking in, it's pervasive, not only from the standpoint of the vertical that you guys have been so successful in, but in that viral, literally, figuratively, if that's the term for viral. Um, where it's spreading into traditional, if there is, again, traditional uh, enterprise and the methodology of how we'll do b uh, business, retailing, marketing, sales, uh, who knows what the future is going to hold. Speaking of... It really uh, is. It's, go ahead. It's, uh, I was just going to say, it's it's funny about mentioning the cruise, because literally this April, there, there's a game or cruise. So <laughs> it's kind of the same thing about traditional businesses looking to appeal to this generation. And so our game Smite and, and other of our titles and, and other titles as well will be available on a cruise ship for I love people it. who want that experience um, on the water. You know, there's something, uh, I'm sure you've done it, but that's worth looking at because there's something there that is amazing that someone would go on a cruise to be someplace else. If you get my point from a virtual, you know, I, I, that's absolutely intriguing as, as heck. Well, uh, speaking of eSports, though, you've got a tournament coming up. Uh, I think it's in January. Give us some insight into that. Yeah, we do. So the way we run it, again, it's very similar to any other league that, that people might uh, follow and get attached to. So online throughout the year, there's uh, teams um, that have a team identity, and they have sponsors, and they, they play in a league format. Uh, literally this weekend in Alpharetta, there's a studio event where some of those North American and European teams are getting whittled down, basically. And it all leads up to this event that is a, a, a global event but played here in Atlanta, which will be January 5th through 8th, and it will take place at Cobb Energy Center. So it's a really cool experience if you've never been to one of these gaming events. Uh, Cobb Energy holds uh, about 3,000 people, so it's a ticketed event. Um, it's not sold out yet, but it will be, and it will be broadcast uh, basically four days of content over the Internet on Twitch and YouTube Gaming and, and some other stations. Probably about 3 million people will view this online. And these teams are competing for a prize pool of $1 million. So wow. you can, you, despite what your mom said, you can actually make money playing video games. Well, I can tell you, I'm thinking, uh, which is it, Monster uh, Energy Drink or Bud? Somebody's got to be back there in the, 
in the bushes that's covering some of that bed because with an audience the the, the key to any to me anyway is the engagement you know we we talk about the demassification and being able to identify the relationship between a customer and a source of consumption you know the product itself when you're that passionate that committed and a selling message or any kind of message is communicated we used to talk about in in movies the uh, product placement for example becomes so much more powerful because they're focused and you're living in a world literally figuratively of noise you're breaking through that noise because you've got this relationship with the viewer. Amazing stuff. I'd love to study more that, into it. Sadly, we're on, exactly running right. out of time, and I'm going to get a lot of heck if I don't ask you because the buzz around town is you guys are expanding. I know a lot of people have come up to me. You, you, you announced that uh, not only are you growing, but you're hiring. What sort of positions are you looking to fill, and how would, they, how would somebody get in contact if that's the, the form to do it? Yeah, thanks for that. We are expanding. We're about 300 people right now. We have over 50 open positions um, that are posted right now. They generally fall into the two major categories of software developers, and, and there's more detail on the website, but uh, programmers, um, we, we need many of them, and then digital artists. Again, subspecialization in 2D art, animation, uh, 3D modeling, but all that information is posted uh, on our website, which is www.highresstudios.com, all one word. And, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love interested folks. i got a feeling that you probably have heard it too many times, but um, I'm going to say that you probably get it from every time you talk about what you're doing. And my response is real simple. Todd, wow, wow, incredible stuff, guy. I mean, no wonder why you're being so successful and driving the, the – uh, the, uh, the, the bar the, even that much further, not only to what you guys are doing, but bringing such attention overall from an industry perspective to the Atlanta for sure, Georgia, southeastern United States, and being such a grand competitor on a worldwide basis. It just speaks so well for our community. So we thank you on a lot of levels. Hey, we are out of time, but thank you so much for what I know has got to be a crazy schedule on your part to take a few minutes to at least dive in a little bit with us today on Tech Talk. It is always a pleasure, Frank. Uh, for anyone who wants to keep up with us, uh, in addition to our website, I do some tweeting. I'm at Todd Allen Harris, and uh, look forward to talking with more folks that are interested in gaming.